so by way of introduction of myself, my name is Tracy Holder. Like many of you, I'm a filmmaker, um, but I'm also a film funding strategist, and on, I'm on both sides of the aisle. I'm out there with my tin cup in hand, like you, writing grants to fund my projects, but I also work with filmmakers on their strategies, and I'm on many funding panels. And so one of the things that I've observed over time is that filmmakers are often intimidated by funders and don't realize the value in working with their funders and seeing funders as allies. And so I thought today, we, th we all thought that it would be great to have a conversation where we're talking, we're having um, conversations between filmmakers and funders who have funded their projects on how those relationships work and what we can learn from those relationships that will serve you with the particular funds that are on the stage, but in general, as you go forward in your funding quests for your films. Um, our challenge today is that we've got a very, very narrow window of time, and so we're gonna try to be as strategic and as efficient as possible to cover a lot of ground, which is what we're gonna try to do. So let me just give you a quick lay of the land as to how our panel will unfold. So first, our three funders will give you a brief introduction and overview of their funds and the kinds of projects that they fund. After they have given us that information, we will then have a conversation between each filmmaker and funder team about how they have worked together and what that relationship looks like. And then we will leave time at the end, 15 minutes for your questions. So without further ado, um, I'm going to turn to my immediate left to my colleague David Weinstein, who is a senior program officer at the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is a very important funder in the film landscape, but one that I think is not on everyone's radar screen. So we're particularly thrilled to have David here. He's come from Washington to be able to share information with you about NEH. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. Um, thanks to Maya also for Amy, Doc NYC for putting this together and my fellow panelists. Um, the lights are like really bright up here and I can't see you all that well, but I'm seeing this as sort of my rock star moment. Like, <laughs> hello, New York, are you ready to rock? But it's probably too early for that. <laughs> thank you for the woo. -hoo. Um, we're a federal government agency. I think I'm the only one here with paper in front of me and that could be a tip off. Uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities is a federal agency. We're a major funder of documentary film. Uh, we fund between, f we put between $5 million and $6 million into documentary film each year. We have over the last several years between five and $6 million. We have two levels of funding. One is uh, development, which is for up to $70,000 and that's to write a script. Um, move a project forward, and then our large grants are to actually produce a film, and that's for up to $650,000. Uh, some news from Washington. We have a new grant program specifically to fund short documentaries. It's called Short Documentaries. It's for films up to 30 minutes long, $60,000 for a single film, up to $250,000 for a series of films. The first program that I told you about, which has development and production, that's called the media program. The media program funds U.S. films or international films. It does not have to be a U.S. subject. Short documentaries, the second program that I mentioned, is a little bit different. Uh, that's tied into a new initiative we have called the More Perfect Union. You can Google NEH and More Perfect Union to find out more information on that but that's looking for US-based projects more directly. So short docs needs to be a US subject and there are certain parameters that we can talk about either later or one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, many but not all uh, NEH funded films uh, are broadcast, usually on public television. Some like The Loving Story were broadcast on HBO. That has been changing though. Over the last few years we have really opened up distribution possibilities. With the level of funding and the fact that it's government funds, we really do want to get bang for our buck. We do want 
a robust distribution plan, but what does a robust distribution plan mean? There is some flexibility. You do not have to have distribution agreements lined up at the time that you apply, but you do have to have a plan that looks credible, like it's really going to happen. A strong festival run accompanied by strong streaming could, uh, for example, be a, an example of a quote robust distribution plan. Uh, we, f we fund stations such as American Experience, American Masters, a lot of those documentaries. We also fund independent documentaries. Um, Mr. Soul, um, the TV show Soul, which I think uh, was part of Doc NYC a couple years ago, received significant funding from us. Maya and I will talk about GI Jews in a minute uh, that Maya and Lisa Addis did. Uh, the Ursula K. Le Guin uh, biography, it's a terrific film that aired on American Masters, but it really originated and was funded as an independent by Arwen Curry. Uh, the film Hillbilly, which also I think uh, was part of Doc NYC last year by Ashley York and Sally Rubin, for example, and Rising Voices on the Lakota Language uh, by Larry Hott are all examples of independent films. Uh, we tend to fund more experienced producers, and again, we can talk about what that means either during the Q&A um, or one-on-one, -on -one. but if it's your first film, NEH probably is not going to, uh, should not probably be your first source of funding. Uh, we recommend collaboration, and we might, if we have time, we'll talk a little about collaboration later. Uh, as opposed to some of my colleagues on the panel, we are not specifically here to fund film. We're here to fund the humanities, and we have found over the year that film is a very effective vehicle for reaching audiences. What do we mean by the humanities? Basically, we're talking about humanities disciplines as colleges and universities would define them. Literature, philosophy, film history, art history, and history more broadly. Uh, the truth is, even though the humanities encompass more than history, a lot of the fun films that we fund are history films and are historical in focus, even though there is some flexibility as far as format. And again, we can talk about that either during the Q&A or in a case-by-case -case basis. Um, a lot of times I've said we can talk about that. Call me, email me, Google me, David Weinstein, National Endowment for the Humanities. You can find me there. We're very open. We are a friendly government agency. I come to conferences like this, and I frequently hear, oh, it's intimidating. I can't figure out any H. I'm not applying. I can help you, I can guide you. We have lots of resources online. We have sample proposals. We have guidelines which for bureaucratic reasons are now called NOFOs, Notices of Funding Opportunities. <laughs> Check out our NOFOs, and I have to be careful as I say that. <laughs> Check out our NOFOs, they're very informative. Check out our NOFOs before you call me. We can talk about that. We can talk about your suitability and your project suitability really for um, our grant programs. I can read drafts of applications as long as I receive them six weeks before the deadlines. I can talk with you. I like talking. I like talking about film. I like talking about film with independent filmmakers. And on that note, I will thank you all, or the ones that I can see through the lights, for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, David. That was a, a great introduction. And um, you know, as as one of those people who ha has applied to NEH. Um, I can tell you that NEH is unlike other funders in, as David said, they are very willing to work with you uh, in a very collegial way and in a very involved way, more so than most funders, and that's generally a capacity issue. On the other hand, what the grant entails is very different from other funders, and I think when Maya and David speak about their collaboration, she can illuminate that further. We do have a slide that has the URLs of, uh, of our three funders, and the URL for NEH, which if, if we can get that slide, oh, there it is. Um, it, the page that that takes you to actually has the applications uh, of successfully funded films, these are feature docs, because I'm assuming many people in the audience are feature filmmakers, but you can see, unlike most funders where it's very hard to see a successful application, NEH does make those available, and there's the URL to see some of those. Um, okay, so we've now covered NEH in terms of what they fund and, and a sample of the kinds of films. We're now going to move down the line to Kat Vecchio, who is the director of uh, the Fork Films Fund. Um, and 
Kat, can you please give us an overview of what Fork is looking for? Hi, so Fork Films is um, primarily a production company, but we have a funding kind of arm, um, and I'm the, as Tracy said, the director of that project. We give about half a million dollars in grants every year to uh, projects that promote peace building in a more just society, which uh, roughly translates into s social issue funding. Um, we uh, look at projects that are both um, US-based that are also international, will fund US or international filmmakers. Um, the only kind of uh, key there is that you have to have a US-based fiscal sponsor. Um, we have moved recently to an invitation-only process, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't um, reach out or email and sort of introduce yourself, say hello. Um, I am <laughs> often at events like this and at panels and pitches to meet filmmakers and track projects. Um, we moved to that process because um, there is basically one of me and there were hundreds of applications. <laughs> and even with, you know, we hire um, review panelists um, and then we do internal reviews as well, it was becoming difficult to actually feel like we were connected to the filmmakers and the projects. Um, and so what we really look for, um, and I'm so excited to be part of this panel, is building relationships with filmmakers that maintain beyond the application and hopefully writing you a check. Um, we care about the work. We're a team of filmmakers. Um, and so we are really looking um, to have, you know, kind of these collaborative conversations. Um, and while we don't have uh, formal mentorship programs, um, we very much uh, like to be in dialogue with, with filmmakers, whether or not um, we have directly supported your work yet. Um, so Kat, can you just, before we uh, move to Jenny and Chicken and Egg, just um, a couple of questions. Can you give us some sense of if there is um, a mission as to like what Fork is looking for in the range of funding? Sure, so I mean our mission, it's, it is broad. Like I said, it's peace building and social justice. Um, and I think that that, often is best discussed in sort of almost one-on-one -on -one with people about the projects that you're doing and how that uh, connects with our work, but there really is um, an emphasis on uh, projects that seek to change a cultural conversation around um, making a more just society. So, uh, you know, it's, sometimes we'll see really lovely like, biography films or um, kind of human interest topics, but there really has to be something underneath that um, that is about cultural change. Um, and then our range of funding is uh, per grant is usually between around ten to $50,000. We'll fund projects anywhere from development through um, the end of post. So those smaller numbers are usually early stage um, development funding. Um, I would say on average our grants uh, are probably around $35,000. Though you know we certainly do make those fifty thousand dollar grants as well, um, and then once projects um, have been funded once, uh, again in that sort of keeping relationships going and conversations going about the work, um, we will sometimes come in with discretionary funds later in the process. Thanks very much. Um, okay, and now our uh, final funder is Jenny Wolfson, the executive director of Chicken and Egg who, as she pointed out when we were upstairs, is also a fundraiser herself because she is responsible for raising the money uh, for Chicken and Egg, and she's done an incredible job in, in growing that organization. Um, so Jenny, can you talk about um, what Chicken and Egg is looking for, the range of funding, and the different opportunities available to filmmakers? Sure, so um, for those of you not familiar with Chicken and Egg Pitcher, excuse me, um, we support women and gender non-conforming filmmakers who are making non-fiction work. So if you're a man sitting here thinking, I'm gonna switch off now, <laughs> um, I will tell you the way into Chicken and Egg Pictures is to co-direct with a woman or a gender non-conforming filmmaker. So we have men in our programs and in our labs and I will in the conversation be generic so that this is helpful for everybody um, because I think the way we look at projects is the way all funders probably are looking at projects. But we have five different programs. I won't go into all of them, but to say that the essence of chicken and egg is to support the film 
and the filmmaker. So we come in to support your project and to support your career. So as we like to say at Chicken and Egg, once in the nest, always in the nest. Um, we have an alumni program of over 350 filmmakers. Um, next year, we'll be giving out a million dollars in grants. We have our one program for first and second time filmmakers, which is our accelerator lab, and that is through application. That is a global program, and you can apply if you are less than 60% shot of your film. I think the important thing to think about with Chicken and Egg and with any funder is does the program match what you're looking for? So that program, for example, is a year-long program. Uh, as of next year, it will be $40,000 grant, but it's three week-long labs, including pitching your film at Sheffield. So if you're like, I don't have time to be in three week-long labs, I don't want to get, get feedback, give feedback, you know, that process is, you know, I, I don't have to, I'm making my film, that's fine. Maybe, you know, it's not the right program. And so we're really looking to build cohorts of filmmakers who go on the journey together and support one another. And then we have other programs like our Chicken and Egg Award, which is through nomination, and that's a $50,000 grant and a year-long program. We have a shorts and series uh, program where we're commissioning work. We have a new program called Project Hatched, which is completion funding, and that's to help you finish your film. It also comes with some mentorship and outreach. Um, and the way to get the completion fund is through invitation at this point, or if you meet with Chicken and Egg at uh, you know, film meat markets and uh, festivals, um, uh, and then we also have an alumnest program. Fantastic, thank you so much. Okay, so I hope everybody feels that they have now some basic understanding of the differences between these three funders and what they fund and sort of the amounts of funding. Um, so now we're going to <laughs> focus on how filmmakers have worked with their program officer or their funder and what the benefits are of that relationship or how that relationship has worked. And so we have paired each funder with a filmmaker with whom they've worked in the past. And so now we're going to have each team sort of talk about what that process was like and how they work together. So to my immediate left is uh, the filmmaker Maya Harris, um, who has, as I gather, worked on multiple projects, NEH projects, and has known David for how long? A while. A while, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and so, can. Years. <laughs> so, um, the project they're going to talk about is a film that was completed a few years back called G.I. Jew. Uh, which was a film that uh, talks about GIs, Jewish GIs during the Second World War. So can you, Maya um, and David, talk about how you work together on that project, what that process looked like? And Maya, can you also talk about the work that you did with scholars, which is part of, as David said, an NEH project? Sure. Um, we, uh, my producing partner Lisa and Addis and I, started working on GI Jews several years ago. Um, it was finished last year and broadcast on TV last in April 2018. Um, and we started the process with the NEH with a research grant, a development grant, um, which kind of just was, I mean, it was an overwhelming topic, although we had started with, speaking of working with scholars, um, there's a book called G.I. Jews, written by a historian named Deborah Dashmore, who was really our first and foremost advisor. Um, her book was about her father and her father's kind of cohort of friends and their experience in World War II, and then she expanded that to include more people. And it was kind of our inspiration. We didn't, we didn't focus on her father, but we, you know, we, we loved the idea. Um, and so we worked with her very closely. We had a lot of meetings with her. Um, we then expanded our team of scholars to include other Jewish historians. I mean, it just so happens that Lisa's husband is a pretty well-known Holocaust scholar. Um, so it was easy for us to access a lot of the people in the field through him and also through Deborah. Um, so we went in for a research grant with a team of scholars um, 
with some research done, we had a sense of what the archival material was. We'd read a lot of books and kind of talked through with, but among ourselves and with Deborah, sort of what the big picture ideas are. I mean, they, they, what they call humanities themes in the proposal itself, which is, I like to think of them as like discussion questions. Like if you're in a book group or a classroom, like what, it's not the things the films are necessarily saying directly, but the things that after you watch the film, open up the conversation about it to sort of extend its reach outside just that viewing. Um, so we got research funding. We used that money to make a trailer, to film some interviews, to do a little bit of archival work, and to write a proposal for production. I'm sorry, there we go. Um, and to write a production proposal, um, which involves writing a script. And the script is includes things you read in books, actual interviews you do on camera, interviews you do on just over the phone, and it's, it's sort of a template for what the script actually is. It changes a lot, of course, once you've really shot the material. Um, but along the way, I guess David gave us a tremendous amount of, amount of feedback in terms of shaping the ideas, sort of the themes, also helped us put together our scholars board and sort of balance that group of people out, which maybe you can talk about a little bit. Um, and then I find having him read a draft is just also really useful. I mean, as sort of a, a second set of eyes and also just someone who has, who knows what the NEH is looking for. And like, uh, like Tracy said, I, you know, I, I raise money for other people's films a lot too, and I sort of feel like the first rule of that is always know your audience. And so knowing the NEH is an important part of writing an NEH grant, just their expectations and the kinds of films they do fund. And you don't want to go forward with the process until you're sure that it's a good fit for your, for your project. Yeah, thanks. Um, that was really good. <laughs> Maybe just um, to highlight a few points. Um, Sometimes internally we call ourselves the world's largest humanities consulting organization, the NEH, that sometimes we also say we're humanities therapists. Tell me about your idea. How do you feel about that? Where is your passion? What are your goals? Where do you want to be three years from now? But those are the kinds of questions that we ask. And why do you think it's a good fit? So it's a combination of therapy and consulting that we do, and it frequently starts with a phone call. Maya says, I have this idea, read this book, G.I. Jews. You had also, I think if I remember correctly, just done a project on Syrian Jews and one thing led to another and you wanted to broaden it out. And here are some things that I'm thinking about. Do you think that this could be a viable project for NEH? And if so, what directions might we go? Then I go into sort of therapist advisor mode. <laughs> Oh, that sounds, you know, good for any age. These are some issues to think about. And we sort of go from there. Usually there'll be a phone call or two. With Maya, this is never an issue, but sometimes with people who are newer to any age, the issue is whether or not they really have looked at the guidelines carefully. And also we have lists of projects that we have funded recently, and it's really important that you look at that I would say before you contact us, and I would say it probably goes for other funders also, just in informal conversations, it can be frustrating from this end of the table if people call, not at a meeting like this where we're just you know, meeting each other for the first time, but if people are calling me or sending a formal inquiry to the NEH without having looked at the materials that are on the website, uh, I find that I'm explaining a lot and taking the time to do that where the information is online. That doesn't mean that you have to have our 17 pages of guidelines memorized or that there isn't some leeway. I know that we're all busy and there's a lot of information out there, but try to at least be familiar enough to ask a couple of questions based on the guidelines that you inevitably will have, or even in terms of the recent projects that we fund that I see that you're going in this direction. Um, so after the initial conversation, where I'll try to guide you a little bit as to whether or not it would be a good, for, good fit for NEH and potential next steps. As Maya mentioned, one of the key aspects of NEH is that we require a Board of Humanities scholars as advisors. 
Usually these are people who are teaching and writing and affiliated with university departments in the humanities. Uh, they could also be, for example, tribal experts or lay experts in a particular field in addition to the scholars. Um, I think you may have used the museum curator on GIGs as an advisor. So they don't have to formally be uh, in universities, all of them, but they need to have that expertise because the key element for NEH in terms of our mission is showing that the scholarship and the analysis is there. And I can help you with that. It's not naming particular people, giving you ideas about where you might be able to find scholars or how you might be able to make your project fit for what NEH is looking for. Another thing that I do in those calls is frequently recommend other funders. And that's the value. I go to a lot of meetings and sessions like this, and I'll say, well, chicken and egg might be a little bit better for these reasons, or you might want to check out A, B, and C, or if the project moves in a certain direction, you can contact me and we can, you know, talk some more. Or I'll read it. Uh, but the next step after a conversation or two, as Maya indicated, is that I will frequently read a draft. It doesn't have to be the whole application. It could even be, David, could you check out the humanity themes and the script? Uh, since Maya submitted the GIG's application, we've shortened the scripting application. We now require 15 pages per hour, which sounds like a lot, but it used to be longer. <laughs> and we really want to get a sense of the story, the analysis, and how the humanities themes and the scholars will be part of the film. We have to be able to go forward through multiple stages at any age, and the chairman puts forward a project. He has to be able to go forward, answer questions from Congress and to questions from ultimately the American people as to how a project fit our mission, which is why the humanities material and the proposal is so important. I'll pause here. I don't. Uh. That's tremendously helpful. And as somebody who has uh, gotten, uh, is working on an NEH project now and has gotten funding, uh, development funding in the past, I just want to add that I think it's imperative that you read an application. Because until you do, you really don't fully know what is involved, and the fact that they make them available is a gift. And so please do uh, you know, check that out if this is something you want to pursue. And the only other thing I want to add uh, um, is Deborah Dashmore, who Maya mentioned, was also a scholar on a previous film that I did. And what I found in my work, and I have a feeling Maya would agree with this, is I loved working with my scholars. They are people who have immersed themselves in a field their whole lives, and they live in this narrow world of the academy. And here you are saying, I'm going to help bring this subject that you're so passionate about, you've devoted your life to, to a broader audience. I'm going to make this accessible through narrative, through storytelling. And um, I have found that that collaboration, for me, I've learned so much. It's been so informative in my own work um, and helped shape my thinking. But it is, as we've said, as David and Maya have said, for a very specific type of film. OK, time being of the essence, we're going to move on to our next filmmaker funder team. Uh, so we, have, we are very lucky to have uh, Jennifer McShane, whose film Ernie and Joe uh, is here at Doc NYC, and I would like to tell you that you can see it tomorrow during its two screenings, but as I understand, it's sold out. There are rush tickets, so come anyway. <laughs> Lots of people don't show. So. But will it, it, does it have a broadcast date yet? It does, it'll be broadcast on HBO uh, at the, uh, on the 19th, actually. But still come see it, it's better to see it with an audience, Yes. and the uh, subjects will be there, so if you oh, can, try to come. Oh, exciting. Okay, and next to, uh, to Jennifer is Kat, who you now know, and, and Fork Films, was a funder of this film, and as I understand it, also of a outreach on a previous film. So can you talk about how the two of you have worked together? Um, yeah, first I just wanna say I'm really, really happy to be participating uh, in this panel because hands down, I don't think I need to tell anyone in this room, but hands down, funding your project is the loneliest, most demoralizing <laughs> part of your project. I don't mean to be a downer, but I'm just saying, you know, I would just say keep going, keep at it, because if you can't just, you know, you have to just revise, talk to lots of people, and go back for more punishment. Um, but uh, but on to be, uh, better stories, which is my relationship with Fork Films, which was terrific. Um, as Tracy mentioned, they were a supporter of my last film, Mothers of Bedford, was about women in prison 
specifically parenting and motherhood. And um, when I started just really early days on this film, Ernie and Joe, when it was just all percolating in my mind, I thought about Fork Films kind of immediately for a couple reasons. One, their mission, as Kat mentioned, about cultural change, social justice, I felt was really embedded in my film, so I felt it would be a good match, and I, I would definitely underscore what um, was just said in the previous couple, is that um, do your research in terms of what you think will fit. Um, I think there's a tendency, especially because I've been there, when you're desperate, you start just applying everywhere instead of really taking the time to see what um, they're looking for. I knew Fork had a history of supporting these kind of projects. I knew I had had a great relationship with them with Mothers of Bedford. Um, so literally, they were the first support in for Ernie and Joe. I called Kat and said, I'm working on this idea. Do you have a few minutes? to talk with me about it. And it was great to walk through it because I could kind of explain some of the nuance that was in my mind in terms of how I was gonna approach this, which made it much clearer to Kat. When I did finally apply, there was some kind of understanding of where um, I was going. And um, also, like, um, I'm sorry, Mark. My David, David okay. geez, I'm sorry. No, not enough coffee this morning. <laughs> As David just said, um, looking at the previous work, um, Abby Disney is connected with Fork Films. I knew she, I had seen a film that she had done called uh, Armor of Light, which was kind of a counterintuitive story about somebody um, you know, who's pro-life and is, comes to this kind of uh, epiphany that he shouldn't be supporting gun, you know, uh, guns in this country. And uh, so my two subjects are off police officers from Texas. It's very counterintuitive to think they would be doing something uh, progressive, <laughs> and they are. So I just thought, you know what, this may just appeal. So I try to really look and see what some of the films or some of the themes that you've seen that aren't the same, but maybe strike a chord. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll punt to Kat now. Um, yeah, I, so I think to kind of go, go further in some of that conversation, um, so I'll back up for a second and say that I'm going to steal this from a, a publishing podcast I like a lot where they were talking about meeting agents, but I think it applies to meeting funders, is that don't look at those conversations um, that you're having in the pro lounge or, um, you know, uh, at a, uh, some kind of event as an opportunity, right? An opportunity to get funding. Because so often we'll get sort of really pitched really hard of like, you know, here's my film. Do you want it? Can, you, can I? And it's like I can't. I can't write you a check. There's a process. There's a whole application. I wish I could. It'd be so much easier, right? <laughs> but like you, we all, all of us, there are different processes and what we look for. But we all, there's a whole thing. Look, instead of an opportunity, look at it as a resource. And I think that that's something that Jennifer really did, um, even from the, the Mothers of Bedford and then Ernie and Joe, was hey, I have this resource. I have these people that. I can call and say, here's what I'm thinking. I think that's what you also expressed. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's why I think it might be a fit for what you might be looking for. And then no, I can say like, yeah, and what's really interesting to me is this. And so when you write your application, it makes sense if you highlight that, if that's truly what's you know part of your film. Or you say like, I'm not sure, like here's my question. Um, you know, it, it might not be the right fit for us, but Again, I, I might know somebody who it, you should be talking to. And so when you approach it as it's like this resource conversation, um, or you know, just um, can I send you my, my trailer, or my work sample, or my scene, and you, can you tell me if you think this is expressing what I, I want it to be expressing? Um, those are great. And what I think that Jennifer does so well, and I mean, there's other filmmakers who do this, but after we supported Mothers of Bedford, um, uh, Jennifer's kind of a rock star with like outreach screenings and just continuing to find the people who need to see these films. But she would just email and be like, hey, we had this great screening or I wanted to forward you this email someone sent to me afterwards about what the film meant to them or, or what it's doing in the world. Um, or just, you know, so she would just sort of drop in and say hello in that way. And it was great because there's no there's no ask there. There's nothing that you need to do other than just say like, yeah, awesome, <laughs> thank you. This is great, and like you're a rock star. Um, and so then you you know when that person kind of comes back to you and says, hey, can we have coffee? And I can I talk to you about my new project? Um, you remember like, oh right, not only do I remember funding this this project a few years ago, 
but you feel like you have this continuing conversation and you think, oh, it's so interesting to hear what you're thinking. And I also really know the kind of film you probably would make with this and what you'll do afterwards. Um, and it's, it's so much easier than a kind of out of the blue, here's my pitch, here's my application, yes or no. Um, because you can ask questions and you can support uh, the filmmaker, but also feel like there's an open dialogue. And so, um, yeah, and I would also then, one more thing is, we've had filmmakers who have applied for something and it wasn't the right fit for us, but they have done the same thing and just said, you know, thanks so much, um, but like every occasionally we'll drop in and just say like, hey, that film that finished it, it's gonna be at Doc NYC. If you're around, you know, try to check out the screening and then just keeping in touch and then they kind of pop back up and say, hey, I'm doing a new project that might be a fit. And again, you're like, oh right, you made that film that was really, really lovely and it wasn't the right fit for us, but I remember this conversation. So even if it's a, a rejection, um, keeping those sort of casual professional networks and relationships alive in ways that are affirming and, and you know, again, a resource uh, to you, I think is really worthwhile. Thanks, Kat and Jen. That's Im immensely helpful. And I'd just like to uh, share some observations I have from what was just shared. So what I heard from Jennifer, uh, which I think is really critical, is the strategic way in which she approached this, right? That she, um, she knew she had done her research. And, you know, we all have such limited time and capacity. One question filmmakers often forget to ask themselves is, are grants the best route, right? Is this a good project for grant funding because it takes so much time and effort, not every project is. But also when she decided that she had a film that had potential for grant funding, she found funders where she's looking at what they're looking for rather than, as she said, just planting seeds randomly, right? So that shows me strategy. And what they both, what I heard and what they both said is that filmmakers, that funders want, they're not only funding your project, right? There is such a wealth of great ideas out there. There's no dearth of great projects that all should be funded. They also want to know who the person is behind it and what your proposal does, but also these conversations, it pulls back the curtain and gives them some kind of window into your thinking and a sense of confidence about how you go about the process. Yeah, I, I would just underscore that it really is a relationship. I think it's easy to forget that, um, even if you have been funded because you're so busy then with production or getting da da da, you forget that this um, relationship is is embedded, is, uh, is in the fabric of your final project, is this kind of incredible support that you've gotten. So, you know, take the extra few minutes to jot a note or, because you know, I'd be excited about the success of Mothers of Bedford and now Ernie and Joe, and you want to share it with, you know, I, I liken it to sending a kid off to college. You hope they go and do <laughs> well in the world, um, and then you want to share their good news. So, Right, and I think of it as um, your, they're literally, right, your funders are literally invested in your success, right? So sharing that with them, they care about Right, they want your films to succeed. They're investing in your projects because they believe in you. And so they are part of your team. And I think that's one of the things we're hoping you'll come away from today, seeing that they are both resources, but also, like my funders have always been so excited and helped open doors for opportunities for the film to be out in the world. Um, and as David said, just one thing I want to underscore is Funders, right, your project may not be a good fit for their fund, but they also circulate amongst other funders. And often people will be on panels and see a project and think, well, this may not be a good fit for this fund, but will tell other funders, hey, I just saw this project. I think it might be a good fit for you. So getting out in the world, being at these events, being at panels, m building relationships, also serves you because word of mouth uh, spreads within a rather tight circle of film funders. Yeah. One quick thing that I wanted to, to share, we've talked a lot about keeping in touch in these relationships, but like, what does that time actually look like? And I would say that for a project that is funded or in production, 
we're maybe hearing from the filmmakers uh, every few months, maybe every three months, four months, or if something sort of major is happening, or they'll say, like, I got more funding, or we just finally got this, this person to agree to the interview. Like, you know, if something sort of happens on the project, the kind of thing where you, you would want to share it. Um, I would say for uh, projects that are currently on the festival circuit, again, the same thing. Hey, we just got into these festivals. You know, we just um, heard from HBO. Like, you know, kind of as updates happen. But then after that, maybe, and maybe it was every six or eight like months, yeah, you know. Right. Again, it sort of, it doesn't have to be like every week. It's sort of the project and the work dictates how often you're in touch. But after it's out in the world, um, you know, even if there's no big update, you know, don't let, like maybe, maybe even once a year, but just sort of ping people. Hey, I'm still out here, still working on some stuff. Um, but I would say that, yeah, that's, let the, let the work dictate how often you're in touch. Great. Okay. So now on to our last team. Um, we have filmmaker Nosheen Dadaboy. Is that, am I pronouncing that? That's very good. <laughs> that is a miracle. Um, who's currently, who is a phenomenal cinematographer, but also a filmmaker. She is currently working on a feature doc called An Act of Worship. And one of her funders is Chicken and Egg. And we're lucky to have Jenny Wolfson, the executive director of Chicken and Egg. And they will talk about their collaborative partnership. Um, so it started with a rejection. Um, <laughs> and I think, um, you know, a lot of what you are all talking about here were like common mistakes that like we were making really early in our process, which was not really, I think probably not sharing our application enough and getting feedback. And so the first round, it was just kind of like, I think this is a good application. I think this will work. And we, we sent it out and we, I didn't even, I don't even think we made it to the second round. Um, and, but I, um, I went to Sundance that year and at an, um, one of the parties there, a, a mentor of mine um, introduced me to Lucila who runs the Accelerator Lab. I don't know if she runs the other labs too. She's she does a, she's a program director. She does a lot of amazing stuff at Chicken and Egg. Um, and I, I asked her if I could get feedback and uh, she was kind enough to set up a Skype call and literally went through the application with me and went through like feedback that they had gotten from um, the panel that had reviewed the applications and that was enormously helpful. Um, it was not just like the written material, but it was like what was not working in the, um, the work sample. And that was like, it wasn't just like what, you know, why is the work sample not working? It's like you're talking about a film that we're not seeing. So a lot of it was just kind of how we were presenting what we wanted the film to be. Um, and then the second, um, the second time we applied, I was able to get the diversity fellowship, um, which is, not, uh, which doesn't exist anymore, but at the time it was a one week um, lab and it was kind of like a really compressed version of what you do over the course of a year. Uh, but a lot of what that uh, lab helped us do was also um, workshop the film and workshop our application. And I think that was what I, what the, my biggest takeaway was, was that like, you really do have to work for it with the application too. Like it's not just like you're gonna, I mean maybe other people do, but I don't. Like you said, I'm, I'm a cinematographer. I'm not good with words. So it took a really long time for us to like work that application and figure out like not really like even catering it towards like what chicken and egg wanted, but like really figuring out like how are we like um, really articulating what our film is in the best possible way and then so then the, I guess it was the third time that I got the Accelerator Lab. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a couple of points. One is, um, if you don't know, um, most film funders now are part of a common core application, which makes your job easier, applying for film funding, because it's more or less the same application now with some specific tweaks per funder. Um, that doesn't mean to say you should apply everywhere because it still takes time and 
you know, at Chignag, we have an application fee of $35, which can be waived if you can't afford it. Um, but I think sort of what was amazing about Nasheen is, you know, you know, schmoozing is part of <laughs> the filmmaker funder relationship. And I know that as a fundraiser myself and sort of, I mean, I don't really <coughs> love that word, but building relationships and networking. And so meeting Lucila, being offered to do a, a Skype call and she actually did it, right? You'll be amazed at how many times we offer feedback to filmmakers <coughs> and they don't get in contact. Um, so if you have that opportunity and you won't always have it, take it because, you know, feedback is gold. Um, and so that's, you know, really important. And she didn't give up, right? She kept applying and applying and applying. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things we're also looking for, as I mentioned at the beginning, is filmmakers who are very open to feedback. Um, you know, ultimately we respect the vision, uh, you know, of the director and it is her film um, to make, but, you know, everybody needs to get other perspectives um, because ultimately you're making a film for an audience. So, you know, we've really seen that in Nasheen, her ability not only to receive feedback, but also to share feedback um, with other filmmakers. Uh, the other thing I just want to add as well is one of the things that we do at Chicken and Egg that I'm hearing, you know, my peers say is that we also, uh, we call ourselves gate openers and not gatekeepers. So we will often, you know, once we support your film, or even if we don't support your film, we'll introduce you to another film funder, either an individual or an organization. And, you know, if you do get funding as a result of that introduction, it's just really nice to write and tell um, the funder. I often, you know, we hear from a funder, oh yeah, we gave $100,000 to that film. Thanks so much for making that introduction. I'm like, oh, I didn't know. <laughs> so that's just like, you know, it just takes like three minutes to, you know, two minutes to write that email. And so updates are really important. Again, for an organization like Chicken and Egg, we're constantly fundraising to support our filmmakers. And the way we fundraise is by sharing things that our filmmakers are doing. So th that information is helping the, you know, the organization survive and, and fundraise as well. And then the last thing I would say um, just for now is, um, so if you do reach out to Chicken and Egg, um, you know, we wish we had 24 hours to sit and look at our inbox and we don't. So if you don't hear back, um, you know, write again two or three weeks later and, you know, keep your email short, um, but follow up, you know, because maybe we were traveling at a film festival at a lab or something and we just kind of, you know, got drowned a little bit in the inbox. So, you know, don't give up. It's totally appropriate. And I can tell you as a fundraiser, if I don't get no, you're going to hear from me again. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, the door is like, you know, always ajar um, unless it's, you know, slammed in my face. And even then I might still go back. Um, so, you know, don't give up to, you know, if you, you know, if your gut tells you. That's why you're such a good fundraiser. <laughs> Duh. So I just want to... Um, build on some of the things that were just said. Um, <coughs> one of the things that I, I took away from what Nosheen was saying is um, how the application process becomes part of your work as a filmmaker, right? And one of the things that I think we struggle with as filmmakers is the isolation, right? And we're inside the fishbowl and it's very hard to have perspective. And so getting that feedback right, is having somebody, it's like working with an editor, right? They have, they see things with fresh eyes. We're so inside the fishbowl that it really is helpful. And so getting people to also read your applications, whether it's funders or colleagues, and, what, and asking whether what you think you're conveying is in fact what you're conveying and what's missing. Um, but also, I know for myself that I've come to see the proposal writing process as the first step in my, in my practice as an artist, as a filmmaker, because I find that every time I write, I'm having to clarify my ideas and to really think through my strategic choices or as, a, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker. And so for me, every time I apply for a uh, fund, my goal is obviously to get the funding, but even if I don't, I'm always furthering my work on my film in the process. And so that's a valuable thing unto itself. Yeah, I just want to say, because I don't want to forget to say this, for us and I think for many funders, the most important thing in your application is your sample, right? We, we want to hear you know, about your story and your vision and where you're going. But the first 10 minutes, and it doesn't have to be polished, and it doesn't have to be a trailer, and it, you know, we, we want to sort of see what your style is and who the characters are, you know, what the story is. But you know, 
you're often being seen by screeners who are watching, you know, 75, 100, 200 applications, you know, over a, a span, you've got to stand out, right? So you're, you're, what you write is so important, but what you show is the most important thing. So if you don't feel like you're ready to apply, maybe you spend that time and you make your sample better and then you apply, but like sample, 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 so important. Great advice. David, I... I yeah, just real quickly, because I know <laughs> sure. we want to leave time for the Q&A, but um, I think especially because I am a government worker working for a fairly large government agency, I don't know if people are necessarily intimidated. Some are, some aren't, but I think that there's a sense that we're not reachable. And I love the advice from both Kat and Jenny in particular, and really everybody on the panel, about maintaining contact, um, even if you decide not to apply, occasional updates are good. Um, if you do want to speak to me, send me an email letting me know about availability, but also feel free to follow up if you don't hear back in a couple weeks, because like I think everybody on the panel, probably everybody in this room, I am busy. Um, but I do want to get back to people, but also I thought especially what Kat said about even after you get a grant from us or even if you don't, those small messages every once in a while are really extremely helpful, not only in terms of building relationships, which is the theme of the panel, but also we take those to the higher ups to show you see this film is going here, look at the feedback that they get. We do a lot of work on the front end, but we don't necessarily see the impact that a film makes unless we hear it from you. We're monitoring a lot of films and we're not out there in the field. So even informal feedback, I know that um, I went to a screening yesterday, Bedlam, I don't know if any of you saw that, but the filmmaker actually passed out a survey that you could fill out online, information about that. It, it's all very helpful to us. And again, I think there's a feeling either that you're bothering us or what's the point or we're too busy or something. And it's all useful even if you don't get immediate feedback from us. That's, that's a great point. Um, okay, so as, as I feared, time would be running out rapidly, and we now have about 13 minutes for questions from the audience. So if anybody has a question, uh, we're happy to answer it. My only request is that you try to have general questions so that we can all learn from the answers rather than questions about very specific projects. Um, so I see, yes, sir. Thank you. What's the longest and shortest funding application uh, cycle that you have been a part of or that you've heard of? Because sometimes you have to wait for next year and then get a city college map or before you get a new trailer or before you bother to kind of sometimes it's seasonal, sometimes they're looking at your house and they're also in need. Right. How do you think about that? Um, so I would say, I mean, there are different ways to fund a film, right? You have to figure out strategically what works for you. The, the downside of grant funding is, as you're pointing out rightly, that it's generally a long, long cycle. Most funders have an annual deadline. Uh, some, like ITVS, it's twice a year, and a few have rolling deadlines, like <coughs> Sundance now has a rolling deadline. But generally, it's six to eight months bef from the time you apply until the time you hear from a funder. And I think with Sundance, it's now down to six months. But as far as I know, unless anybody knows of any other fund, there isn't a process. I mean, as Kat pointed out, you often have 300 or even 500 applications, and you're going to fund between 10 and 15 of those, right? The and so that process and capacity is very limited and it's a long process. So that's the downside of funding through grants. The upside is that unlike investments or broadcasts, you keep all of your rights. And that gives you a lot more freedom because it's not an investment. These are charitable donations. They're donations, they're tax deductible, whatever they are. They're they're, they're not something where the funder is recouping in the sense of an investment where they're looking for um, return on investment profit. So that's always the challenge is, do you have the time to apply and to wait out uh, until you hear? But that's also why you have to be strategic in 
knowing that you're putting forward a competitive application, right? You don't want to waste your own time and why getting input from your funders before you apply or looking at successful grant applications can only serve you in putting your best foot forward when you apply. Anybody want to add anything to that? I, I mean, just, you know, we're less time fortunately and it depends on the program. It could be anywhere from like one to five or six months. Um, but if you get into semi-final rounds with chicken and egg, we'll come back to you and we will ask you for updates. So if you have new material, new funding, and so if you have contact with a funder and you've applied and you have done, you know, shot something really amazing and different, you could always try and see if you can, you know, still send that if you're going through the rounds. Uh, we're within the range that Tracy mentioned. We're about eight <laughs> months. We have multiple stages and I don't want to go through all of it now, but one of them is peer review panels that we convene. And if any of you are interested in being a panelist, let me know. We break down panels by subject matter. So we look for people with particular expertise, but if it's a good fit, it's a great way to learn more about the NEH process. Some of the people up here, a few people out, uh, you know, who are here today in the audience are, have been panelists. And again, it's a good way to get a sense of things, and that is also part of the reason why it takes several months. The number of applications, the multiple stages, including peer review, but come see me afterwards or give me contact information with the note about panelists and I keep a database and if there's a good fit, um, I'll call you and it's a good way to serve your country, serve your field and learn a little bit more about the NEH in the process. Great advice. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there are pet peeves. I mean, look, ev you know, everyone's different. Every organization's different. But if you're like, I love storytelling. I'm making this film because I'm a storyteller. I'm like, you know, <laughs> we know that. Um, and again, you've got to stand out. So, um, so that's one little mini pet peeve. The other one is that people spend too much time, I think, talking about the genesis of the story and why they want to tell the story and the history and the whole lead up to like why they're at this place. And, right. and that is important context, we want that. But we want to know where your story is going, um, you know, how you're going to tell the story, the structure. So make sure you're explaining you know, what your film, what you're trying to do with your film. Even if you're really early on, you don't have to have all the answers. This is non-fiction. Um, that, that's the great thing about documentary. But you know, we spend time talking about what you're trying to do and where you're going. And the other final pet peeve is, you know, if you're making a film about the three strikes and you're out, and you know, and you know, your criminal justice, and you know that a film was made about that, you know, <laughs> six months or a year before, a don't diss the film if you didn't like it, <laughs> um, and b you know maybe say you know this is building on this film and here's what I'm doing that's different. So you know that doesn't mean to say because there's one film about criminal justice there can't be another one. But if you can help us see, because sometimes screeners might look at the film and go, oh, I've already seen that film about this, you know, candidate of, you know, whatever, running for office. And, um, you know, how is it different? Hel help us kind of see that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And um, that's what I call the elephant in the room. It's like the thing you wish the funder wouldn't see in your application. like a film on refugees, right? There's no dearth of them right now. And the question is, what is different? What are you adding to the story? And hoping that they're not gonna know that there are lots of films about refugees or about mass incarceration is probably not your best strategy. So you wanna frame the response. You wanna anticipate any question that a funder might have when you're writing your application and provide a cogent answer. For example, I worked on a film that was on POV last, uh, last month, um, and in fact, Chicken and Egg and Fork funded it, um, and the film had a very high budget. Well, the film was set in Indonesia. The filmmakers, I was a producer, they were, the two directors had to go to Indonesia eight times. They ended up interviewing the Donald Trump equivalent of, of Indonesia, and as a result, we needed to get what was, who even knew, kidnap insurance and security. And the cost for that is very high. So though we had a high budget, we were able to explain 
why it was a high budget, right? It was eight trips to Indonesia, it was these costs. And as a result of that, no funder questioned the fact that we had a high budget, right? There was a logic that we were able to reveal. And so I think it's important not to just put out information and hope for the best, but to, you know, as I said, peel back the curtain and help them understand why something is the way it is, why you're making these choices. Um, it's called Grit, and I think it's still streaming on POV. Uh, the filmmakers were Cynthia Wade and Sasha Friedlander. Yeah, I mean, in addition to what I think you may have alluded to, my pet peeve about maybe not doing research on the fund before the initial contact. Um, the pitch is really hard because it's a lot of pressure, it's a lot of money for you, and it's important, and you're trying to make an impression on the funders here. and. I think all of us really empathize and all of us have been on your side of the table for one reason or another. Me as both a filmmaker and as somebody who writes books and has been pitching publishers. So I think a lot of us empathize, but it's important to be a good listener at that conversation also. And it's hard because you're thinking about pitching, you're thinking about repositioning your film or explaining why your film might be a good <laughs> fit. but. It's really important to really listen to the funder's response. And I know I will very seldom say, that will never work at any age. I never <laughs> want to hear from you again. <laughs> or that's incredible, it's definitely going to get funding. Because both of those responses, first of all, I don't know enough about your film. And second of all, it's a little bit arrogant of me to even try to make that pronouncement at this stage. But I will say, well, I'm not quite sure it's right for these reasons. And it's more helpful. There is a way to give a more thoughtful response to that versus no, 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 you don't understand and basically repeating the pitch in a slightly different language. Right. And I don't know if other funders experience that also. There's nothing wrong with saying let me think about that or how would this be a better fit for NEH or what other funders might this be a better fit for or you know, trying to sort of probe that or show that you've at least heard that or similar questions. It's really, really hard, but try to make it into a conversation then rather than multiple stages of a pitch. I don't know if other funders have had similar experiences or have similar advice or even filmmakers. Yeah, no, that's really great advice. Um, right, the question is, are you a good fit? And the funder is gonna know that better than you are. And strategically, right, it's not a good use of your time to try to convince a funder that you're a good fit if they don't think you are, and to hear how you might be or what to consider is really key. Okay, sadly, I think we're down to one last question. I see somebody, yes, it's you. I mean, I, I think that the only way I could see that being a detriment is say your goal was $50,000 and you raised $200 because it was clear that the whole campaign was like sort of neglected and half thought out. Then you sort of think like, oh, okay, like is there a follow through? But like if you tried to raise 50 and you maybe got halfway there and it just, it, you know, but it was clear that there were updates posted and you know, active, but it just didn't, it didn't happen. Like that's, you know, um, if, if you want to like sort of address that in your fundraising um, uh, strategy where you sort of say like we, you know, really thought that enthusiasm would translate to dollars and it didn't, but we still believe that that enthusiasm is an audience. You know, that's, that works. Um, and if you had a lot of success, it, that's great because you can, but what I would say is it's about the um, the the work and sort of saying like, hey, we're a team who is committed to making this film and doing the follow through, but the dollar amount is for at least to me feels less relevant other than you're looking at like what your budget is and how you're planning to raise all of it. Um. So I agree with everything Kat said and I would just broaden it and say that 
what we're also looking for is can you actually fund the, the film? So we know we're a small part of, you know, if you're getting a 40K grant and your film is $500,000. Um, so, you know, showing how you think you're going to raise the money and a lot of people just kind of put down, oh, here are the six funders and they put, and you know they haven't really researched or thought through other sort of possibilities of other funders to go to. So that's really important. And I want to say, because before... It Th this ends also like don't take rejection personally you know the last 50 films yeah. that get to the accelerator lab are all amazing and we're creating a cohort and it's not personal and you just have to keep trying and it's timing and it's when we're curating our films we're looking at age and geography and race and class and subject matter and you know so many different things and that's kind of how we'll make our final decision and so a rejection doesn't mean that your film shouldn't be made and that you're not a great filmmaker. I just want to um, piggyback on that a little bit. Uh, a, about the rejection. I've had so many rejections I could paper like a small bathroom um, <laughs> and, and still got the film made. So um, keep going. But the other thing I wanted to mention is that there's uh, so many amazing film projects out there. Um, and we have a limited pie. You know, we're all trying to get pieces of this one pie. So what I would also suggest, which was helpful for me and Ernie and Joe, was I also went outside of film funding and found uh, funders who were interested in my topic. Now, it doesn't always work because sometimes they are not interested in film at all, but in my case, two of them were very, very committed to mental health mm -hmm. and saw, could understand the power of a powerful film about that topic in an unusual, told in an unusual way. So two of my significant funders were mental health um, believers. So I just want to mention that. Kind of keep your eyes open for other things that might dovetail with what you already have from film funding. That's a really great point. And, and one thing I suggest to people, and one of the things that I do when I initially start my projects, is I look at other similar films, similar in theme or topic, and look at where they got funding, right? I'll go to the credits of their film. I'm the only person in the theater who stays to the end of the film because I'm looking at who, f I, that's the thing I want to know. Like, I don't really care if it's a good film, I want to know who funded it. Um, <laughs> or I'll go to their website. Um, and so that is uh, another way to think about funding strategy. I know we're over time. I just want to clarify something from earlier. I mentioned the film Bedlam in terms of surveys. <laughs> we did not fund that film, but I know the filmmaker liked the film and I was mentioning it in that context. I just didn't want there to be any misunderstandings. Thank you all. I wondered about that. Yeah, so good I, to I, know. I, Thank you. I was like, that's really an odd, an yeah, yeah, that's an odd NEH film. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um,